Thank you for tuning in to our Sunday night broadcast here at Putman Baptist Church. This time next week, we will have our, hopefully our sanctuary open back up on March 7th, where we invite you to join us in person if you feel comfortable doing so. We have room to spread out. Uh, we ask that you bring masks. We'll have masks. Hand sanitizer available if you would like to come. If you don't feel comfortable coming, of course, continue watching right here from home, Facebook or YouTube or however you tune in. But uh, we do hope to open up next Sunday. So hope you can join us for that. Tonight, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 3, finishing our seventh of the seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor. As you may be turning to Revelation 3, I want to talk to you for a second about armadillos. You might not know this, but there are at any given time an estimated 30 to 50 million armadillos living in the United States, mostly in the Southwest. And each year it's reported that anywhere between a quarter million and half a million armadillos become victims of roadkill. It's interesting because God has given them a natural defense. Their thick, leathery skin protects them from predators, but armadillos always find out that they are no match for a car. In fact, National Geographic's website has referred to them as hillbilly speed bumps, speaking of their hapless propensity for being run over by cars. Even though they are protected from predators, armadillos find out the hard way that the middle of the road is a dangerous place to live. The middle of the road is a dangerous place to live. As bad as it is for armadillos to live in the middle of the road, that's the way the people of the church of Laodicea chose to live, right in the middle of the road. Maybe tonight I'm talking to some church members who too have chosen to live in the middle of the road. Instead of picking this side or that, you go right down the middle. It might be a little easier to do that at times, but you might find out like the armadillo that you can only be in the middle of the road for so long. You need to pick a side tonight. And that's what John, through the message given to him by Jesus, conveys to the church at Laodicea. We've looked at the first six churches already in chapters 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. We talked about Ephesus, which was the loveless church. Jesus says, you have left your first love. We talked about Smyrna, the persecuted church, and Pergamos, the compromising church. We talked about Thyatira, the corrupt church. We've talked about Sardis, which was the lifeless church or the dead church. And finally, we talked about Philadelphia, which was the obedient church. Tonight, though, as we look at Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, we see that they are the lukewarm church, the church that chose to live right in the middle of the road. So as this message, this final message was given to this church, we're going to look at the situation, the way that Jesus assessed the people in the church at Laodicea. So let's look at the situation in verse 14 and 15. Here's what the text tells us. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were either cold or hot. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we see the situation as it is explained to them here. But it begins with an identification of the author. We've seen this now seven times with each of the churches. Jesus is described in a unique and poetic way. So here he refers to himself as the Amen. This is the only time in Scripture where Jesus gives himself that title. But he says, I am the Amen and the faithful and true witness. That word amen has been kind of popular over the last couple of weeks when you might have noticed that when the 117th Congress convened this year, a representative Emmanuel Cleaver who called uh, everyone into session with his invocation and his opening prayer, he closed his prayer by saying, you know, we ask these things. He said, well, actually, oddly enough, he prayed in the name of the monotheistic God Brahma, which was very interesting from a Methodist pastor to pray to a Hindu God, which was polytheistic. But anyway... He closed by saying, amen and a woman. So a lot of people have talked about this word, amen, and maybe you've seen it in the news recently. The word amen, contrary to what he might have thought there that day, is not a gendered word just because it has M-E-N at the end. Amen is a Hebrew word that we don't really translate into English. We just adopted it straight from Hebrew. So the M-E-N has nothing to do with our English understanding of men or women. 
So we don't need to add a women or a woman to the end of our prayers. Amen is a Hebrew word that simply means so be it or may it be so. Or this is a true statement, something that I agree with or something I hope will come to pass. So that's the reason we say amen at the end of our prayers. We, we say all these things. We pray for what we want. And then we say amen at the end. Lord, I hope these things will come to pass. It's the reason that some of you might shout out amen during a sermon when you hear something that you agree with and you say amen, that's true, I believe in it, I agree with it. But here Jesus refers to himself as the amen. He's saying I am the amen. That's an interesting title for Jesus to give himself. But actually he didn't make it up. Twice Isaiah uses this idea to refer uh, to, to God. The prophet calls him the God of truth, as it's translated into English, or the God of amen. You can see that in Isaiah 65, 16. God is referred to as the God of amen or the God of truth. So Jesus identifies himself this way, coming right out of the gate, saying what I'm about to say to you, Laodiceans, is the absolute truth. Because I am the God of amen. What I say is gospel. And so he identifies himself not only as the amen, but as the faithful and true witness. As a witness, Jesus is now testifying to what he has seen with his own eyes from the people in Laodicea. In a courtroom, a judge has no interest in a witness that is not giving a first-hand eyewitness account. A witness cannot take the stand and give something that they heard from someone who said that somebody said that no, if a witness did not see it, they are not a credible witness. But Jesus, whose eyes are in every place, as he's already identified himself, he is the witness who can stand faithfully and lay to see and say, I know firsthand what you guys are doing. I know exactly what you guys are like in your heart of hearts. He is not only a true witness, but a faithful witness. What Jesus says here is absolute truth, and no one can argue with it. He's also referred to here as the beginning, at the end of verse 14, the beginning of God's creation. Some look at that phrase, Jesus being the beginning of God's creation, and they conclude that he must be a created being. That you have God who created Jesus and then created the heavens and earth and the world and everything else. But that Jesus is a created being. That is a misunderstanding of what he is saying here. Jesus is not a created being. Just because he's identified here as the beginning of creation does not mean he was the first thing created. On Sunday mornings, we've been going through Colossians. In fact, we wrapped it up here just this morning. We talked about this Colossian heresy that believed that Jesus was not God in the flesh, but was an emanation from God, something sent out by God. And so the Colossians believed that Jesus was good, but he was not divine. Well, many of the Laodiceans believed the same thing. The fact that only 10 miles separates Laodicea from Colossae, it means it's no wonder to us that they would have the same false understanding of Jesus. See, this idea, this phrase here that Jesus is the beginning of creation does not mean he was the first thing created. But here in Greek, it's crystal clear. It means that he is the source or origin of God's creation. God didn't create Jesus and then other stuff. What this means is Jesus created everything. It's the same concept as what John would write earlier in his gospel in the first chapter when he says all things were made by him, Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. So to deal with this heresy that says Jesus is good, but he's not to be worshipped, Paul would write to the Colossians that he is the firstborn of creation, meaning he is the most important thing out of, he, he outranks everything in creation. And John, through Jesus, would say that he is the origin of all things, the origin of all creation. So here's the situation. After Jesus has identified himself as the one who created them, as the witness of what they're doing, and as the amen, the faithful and true one, to give an account of what the Laodiceans are really like, here's the situation. You're lukewarm. 
You're not hot. You're not cold. Oh, I wish you would pick a side, but like the armadillo of the southwest United States, you are right in the middle of the road. The situation is that they were lukewarm. Now, to understand why he uses this analogy, we must understand the water system in Laodicea. Laodicea was a great location as far as defense goes. It was a fortified city because of where they were located. It was a great city for defense, but a terrible city for water. They had to pipe their water in through aqueducts. They had no natural water resources in Laodicea. So in Colossae, which is just 10 miles away, the water was ice cold, crystal clear, good water from Colossae. But by the time it was piped in those 10 miles through the aqueducts, that ice cold water in Colossae was just lukewarm. On the other side, there was Hierapolis, which was known for its hot springs, their piping hot water. But again, by the time the hot water was piped in through the aqueducts from Hierapolis, that hot water was also lukewarm. The people in Laodicea knew full well how frustrating it was to have water that was lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, and they would have preferred one or the other, but they got neither. When we think about water that is hot, we can think about good uses for water. It's better to clean with hot water, to wash our hands with hot water, to do the dishes with hot water, to mop our floors with hot water. We even mix hot water with our drinks to make coffee and tea and different kinds of beverages. We can think about uses for cold water, how it's refreshing, especially after a hard day's work under the hot sun. But lukewarm water? No thank you. I have no use for lukewarm water. I don't want to drink room temperature water. Either boil it and make it coffee or put ice cubes in it and drink it cold. But I don't want lukewarm water. Nor did the Laodiceans. But that was all that they had. The Lord says you are lukewarm. You are like that water. Neither the hot water from Hierapolis or the cold water from Colossae. You are lukewarm water. Spiritually, those that would be hot would be the saved, the really redeemed, the righteous, the ones that are working and ministering and serving God. The cold would be the unsaved, the ones that maybe we would say are a hardened atheist or members of another religion or people that want nothing to do with the Lord. They're not saved and they'll tell you so in a second. But the lukewarm, well, they're the pew sinners. They're the ones who show up, sit down, get up, leave, and never do a thing to serve. They don't give. They don't volunteer. They sit there, but they think that their presence is somehow good enough for everybody to be happy. The pew sitters that don't do anything, they are the lukewarm. Now, maybe they will do some things from time to time, but that is purely for a show and not for the Lord. Like the Pharisees, who would be furious if you suggested that they were cold. But they certainly weren't hot. They weren't on fire about anything. They weren't pumped up about anything except themselves. They're lukewarm, right down the middle of the road. We all know what Jesus says about him here in a second. He says, because you are neither hot nor cold, in verse 16, look, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you, spit you, or vomit you out of my mouth. We all know what it's like to be sick to our stomach. That's what God is saying here about the lukewarm church. About the lukewarm individuals that make up the church. You make me nauseous. You make my stomach turn. I wish you were hot or cold, but you were lukewarm. Look, the people in Laodicea that drunk the hot water that had turned lukewarm or the cold water that had turned lukewarm, it would turn their stomach. And here the Lord says, that's exactly what you do to me. Have you ever gotten sick shortly after eating something and then you associated your sickness with that certain thing and you will never eat it again? Someone says, hey, let's get pizza tonight. And you say, oh, no, no, no. I got sick eating pizza once and I've never had pizza again. The thought of pizza makes me sick. Have you ever said that? We associate something with that which made us sick. Here the Lord says that I associate you with that which makes me sick. 
The very thought of you, Laodiceans, makes my stomach turn. When I think about what you're really like there in Laodicea, I get nauseous in my stomach. I get that queasy feeling. I want to throw up when I think about you being that lukewarm person. Is he describing you? Look, I'm not asking tonight if you go to church. You wouldn't be hearing me otherwise. And neither am I asking if you're a cold, hard-hearted atheist. I'm not asking if you're a murderer or a person who abuses children. I'm asking if you're lukewarm. I'm asking if you're right down the middle. We need to pick a side. If you are down the middle of the road, it is time to pick a side. He says, I would that you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. He's saying you need to choose for yourself right now that it is time to wake up. It is time to get involved in something. It is time to become passionate about something. It is time to care about something. We need to check your spiritual pulse and see if there's even anyone there. He says, I need you to be hot. I need you to care. I need you to get excited. But lukewarm will never do. As long as you remain in your lukewarm condition, the Lord says, you make me sick. Is God's stomach turning at the thought of you? If the amen, the faithful and true witness were to come in here and assess you today, not me from the outside looking in, not some person who you may have fooled, but if the faithful and true witness who knows hearts and sees all things, if he were to describe you today and assess your situation, would he say, you make me sick? You make me nauseous in my stomach. I wish you would turn and change before my stomach turns again. After assessing their situation, he then gives them the sickness. He talks about the sickness, their own sickness. Not just the Lord's stomach turning, but the people in Laodicea were sick. Look what he says in verse 17. For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched and pitiable or miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and to buy white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. The people of Laodicea were sick. The Lord is saying, you make me sick. But then he turns right around and says, and you are the ones who are also sick. The worst thing is that they were sick but did not even know it. They didn't realize that they were sick because they thought that they were so good. He says, you are rich and in need of nothing, but you have no idea that you are poor and miserable and wretched and blind and naked. One of my favorite athletes of all time was Pistol Pete Maravich, the basketball star out of LSU who had a, a long NBA career as well. Though I was only three years old when Pistol Pete died, I studied his life and his practice habits, his routine, and, and was a big fan of Pistol Pete's when I was growing up. But the way that Pistol Pete died, if you remember this story, he was 40 years old. He was playing a pickup game of basketball. He had just retired from the league. He was playing basketball with Dr. James Dobson from Focus on the Family and a group of other people. Playing a pickup game there on the court. When just like that, Pistol Pete fell over, dead on the spot. Pistol Pete did not know until, he never knew, I guess. It was not discovered until the autopsy that he was born with a congenital heart defect. His autopsy revealed that he was born without a left coronary artery. And ironically and sadly, his final words on earth were, I feel great. I feel great, Pistol Pete said before he fell over dead. Pistol Pete was sick and did not know it. He was a good Christian man, a great guy, but he was sick and he did not know it. Just like the people in Laodicea. They were sick, but they did not know it. Now, I'm not comparing Pistol Pete spiritually to the people in Laodicea, but as he had a spiritual, uh, a physical condition that was undiagnosed, so the people in Laodicea had a spiritual condition that was undiagnosed until Jesus sent this letter that says, you're sick. And the condition is your sin, your sinful state, your lukewarm state, the fact that you don't care about anything but yourself. You think that you're rich, but you're poor and miserable and wretched and blind and naked. 
The thing about Laodicea too, outside of the fact that they had no good water, they had a couple of things that were going well for them. We must understand that they had a banking center in Laodicea. They were financially prosperous. There was a lot of gold, a lot of commercial transaction, a lot of money stored in Laodicea. And many of its residents, although they had lukewarm water, they were rich because of the banking center. Also, Laodicea was famous for their production of soft black wool. Whereas almost all clothing in that day and age was white and Laodicea, they made black garments out of their black wool. It was soft to the touch. It was comfortable. And people would come from miles away and pay top dollar for their soft black wool. That was rare. And people wanted to get their hands on it. Finally, Laodicea was famous for having an eye clinic. One of the leading eye clinics in the world. In Laodicea, they had developed an eye salve that people would come from around the world to buy to anoint their eyes with this eye salve. These three factors brought much revenue into the city. It was a banking center, they had soft black wool, and they had an eye clinic with their eye salve. So prosperous was the city of Laodicea that when they were ravaged by an earthquake in the year AD 60, they rejected financial aid from Rome. They had plenty of money and they were proud of it. They were rich all right, but only as one regards money. Jesus said they did not realize that they were poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. To quote John MacArthur, believing they were to be envied, they were in fact to be pitied. They thought they were the envy of the world because of all that they had, when in reality, people should have felt sorry for them. How is it possible that they were so wealthy materially, yet so miserable spiritually? How did the amen, the true and faithful witness, assess them to be in such poor shape? Well, I think this is one of the ways that the church of Laodicea resembles the American churches today. See, here in America, even those of us that would not consider ourselves to be rich, we're not millionaires, we are vastly wealthier than the majority of the world. You know, most of the world lives on a dollar a day or less. So the fact that here in America, we own houses and we drive cars and we have bank accounts, even if we live paycheck to paycheck, one of our paychecks would probably feed a village for a year in another part of the country. So here in America, you might not think you're rich, but we certainly are. Compared to the 7 billion people in the world, Americans are doing quite well. So many of us, if we were honest, we would assess ourselves to be prosperous. We have a roof over our head. We have clothes in our closet. We don't skip meals. We put gas in the car. And we might complain that the cost of a gallon of gas is rising, but we're still making our car payments, still filling up our tanks, still paying our insurance, still getting around, still buying clothes, still buying food. Yeah, we are doing pretty well materially and financially in the United States. So many of us then have fallen into the trap that says, well, God is blessing us, so we must be doing something right. If, if God was not happy with the way we live, surely we would not have all this stuff. We would not have multiple vehicles. We would not have extra money to throw around and go on vacations. The fact that we have all this must mean that God is blessing us. It must mean that we are living right. It must mean that we are doing something right. And these are the rewards that God has promised for our faithful living. And so we preach the American gospel that says, whom the Lord loves, he blesses. Whom the Lord loves, he blesses. We look at the less fortunate and we decide that they must not be living for God. That poor person must not be a good Christian. That person that is begging and that person that is struggling, they must have some sin in their life. Because if the Lord was really pleased with them, then he would give them more stuff. If we are living our best life now, if every day is a Friday, then we must somehow be right with God. And that, I believe, is the lie that the American church has bought into. We are so much like Laodicea. Oh, we are rich, all right, financially. But many of us do not realize that we are poor, miserable, wretched, blind, and naked. We think the rest of the world just needs to become like us, when in reality, we would probably do well to become a little bit more like the rest of the world. We resemble that American pastor that told the visiting missionary, our congregation prays for you in your poverty. And that missionary responded to the pastor by saying, no, sir, our congregation prays for you 
in your prosperity. The belief that because we have so much means that we must be right with God when many of us are lukewarm and right down the middle of the road, neither hot nor cold. But yet we have assured ourselves that we must be right with God, that we don't need to make any changes, that we don't need to repent. We don't need to do more. We don't need to serve more. We don't need to get outside of our bubble because life is good. God must be blessing. And it's led many of us to continue down a lukewarm middle of the road path of sin. Many people in America, we share, we will share the same fate as that rich man that refused to give Lazarus even the scraps from his plate, who in hell lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Never mistake the blessings you have in life for the God's seal of approval. The Laodiceans had plenty of money from their banking center, their soft black wool, and the eye clinic and their eye salve. But God said, no, you're sick. So after assessing the situation that they're lukewarm and telling them they're sick because they're miserable, poor, blind, wretched, and naked, now the Lord offers them the solution. What do we do about it? Where do we go from here? Look in verse 18. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And I sought to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquer. And sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The solution for their sickness and their situation is that good old-fashioned word, repent. Oh, how America hates this word, repent. I imagine they hated it. And let them see it as well. Repent, he says. I counsel you to repent. Here's my prescription for your sickness Repent. Turn from your ways. Boy, in America, we don't like the word repent. That's offensive, preacher. Don't talk about repentance. You'll turn them off. You'll turn them away. Don't tell me to repent, preacher. Jesus died for all my sins and everything's been forgiven. It doesn't matter what I do. No, I believe if Jesus stepped into the average American church today, he would say not only are you wealthy but not knowing that you're poor, not only are you miserable and blind and wretched and naked, you need to do this one thing, American church. You need to repent. That's always been the message of Jesus. In fact, the Bible says after the baptism of Jesus, when he began his ministry after the temptation of the wilderness, he launched out in his earthly ministry and it says, then he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's exactly what John the Baptist preached. As his summary statement of his ministry says, John the Baptist preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Paul preached repentance. Peter preached repentance. And every faithful preacher down through the years has preached Repentance. It's the only way that a person can ever be, be saved and the only way that the lukewarm can ever become right with God again. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. Change your way of thinking. Get rid of the attitude that says you're fine the way you are and adopt the biblical mentality that says we need Jesus to fix us. We need Jesus to change us. He's, he says, here's what I want you to do. Yes, Laodicea had a banking system, but Jesus says, buy your gold from me. Playing off of their banking system. He says, you buy gold backed by me. Pure gold. Gold that has been refined in fire. This refers to the gold that was removed from all impurities. The purest gold imaginable. I believe the streets of gold and glory will be like this kind of gold. Peter wrote, that a, wrote of a faith that is more precious than gold. The prescription from Jesus then seems to indicate that they need to be saved, that they need uh, the kind of faith that would be free from impurities. They might have had some beliefs, but they did not have a saving faith. Buy your pure gold for me, Jesus says. And then he says, buy white garments. Remember their wool industry, that rare, costly, Precious, soft black wool. Jesus says, yeah, I'm glad everybody's walking around with their black wool on, but you need to buy white wool for me. 
White symbolizes purity. Don't misunderstand me. This has nothing to do with skin color or race. This does not mean that white is superior to black in any way. But from a clothing standpoint, a purely clothing standpoint, white has always symbolized purity because every single stain stands out on white. Whereas the color black or darker colors will hide those stains. Just last night for dinner, we had spaghetti. I was wearing a light colored shirt, about the color of this one. And when I saw that spaghetti sauce, I thought, I am surely going to get spaghetti sauce on my shirt. And I went and changed and I put on a black t-shirt. Because I knew that as sure as I'm standing here today, I'm going to get spaghetti sauce on my shirt. The black fabric will hide the stains from the spaghetti sauce. But if I wear this shirt and get spaghetti sauce on it, this shirt will be ruined. It's not going to come out. It will stain this shirt. It's the reason the bride wears white on her wedding day. It's a symbol of her purity as she stands before the Lord, her husband, and the congregation. You can't hide a stain when you're wearing white. It stands out like a sore thumb, and so it stands for purity. When you wear dark, you can have spaghetti sauce. You can have grass stains on your knees. You can spill whatever you want on it, and it's going to be hidden on that which is dark. They're walking around wearing their dark wool, which without even realizing it was symbolic of the fact that they were dirty, that they were full of stains, that they had spaghetti sauce all over their shirt, that they were stained with sin, but it was being concealed by the black wool. But if they would put on white garments from the Lord, symbolically pure, it would show that the Lord would remove all the stains of their sin. They needed a faith that was pure and they needed to have white garments that showed that they've been given a new start, a clean slate with their sins forgiven. Finally, the Lord tells them to buy eye salve from him. Yes, they had a medical clinic, an eye clinic. Yes, they developed their own eye salve. But here the Lord says, you need to get a taste of your own medicine. Why don't you take that ointment you're so proud of and try some yourself? Maybe then you'll be able to see just how miserable you really are. You think you're clothed, but your eyes are so bad you can't see that you're naked. You think you're rich, but you can't see that you're poor. You think you're doing all right, but you can't see that you're sick. So Jesus says, here's my counsel to you. Buy gold from me. Put on white garments and get eye salve from me. Verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke, I discipline, I chasten. Jesus loves the whole world. He loves every person that's in it, even the unsaved. He loved the Laodiceans. But it does not appear that any of the Laodiceans loved him back. I know I said this Wednesday night. But it's not the people that the Lord loves that go to heaven. It's the ones that love the Lord back in return. Hell is filled with people that the Lord loves. Just because the Lord loved them did not mean that they were right with God and headed for heaven. They still needed to repent. As he tells them there in verse 19, be zealous and repent. Zeal is the opposite of being lukewarm. A person who loves God and a person who hates God both have zeal. One is a good zeal of affection for God. The other is a bad zeal being turned off to him. A militant atheist has zeal, but the Laodiceans had neither. Right down the road, the middle of the road, they were lukewarm. So the Lord is saying, hey, wake up. You need to get zeal. You need to become zealous. You need to repent of your sins. You need to realize that you can't just walk through life in a daze. You need to pick a side. And the Lord would prefer that they pick the hot side, the good zeal, to become zealous for him, repent of their sins. Get saved, he's saying. Get sold out. So church member, wherever it is you attend, what are you doing for the Lord? Do you serve in any way? Do you do anything? Do you give? Do you give your time? Do you pray? Are you passionate? Do you read and study God's word? Or do you just rely on hearing a sermon once or twice or three times a week? Do you study God's word for yourself? Do you have a hunger to know more? Do you want to grow in your faith? Do you want to feel closer to God? Or do you just go through the routine? Verse 20, very popular verse. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears me and lets me in, well, I'd be more than happy to come in. Oftentimes we use this verse during the invitation. We tell people, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart and he's knocking. 
Are you going to let him in? And that's a fair analogy and a, I think an appropriate way to use the verse, but let us not realize, let us not misunderstand how it was used originally. Jesus is not saying, I'm standing at the door of your heart. He tells the layer of the sea, I'm standing at the door of your church. I want to come into your church. I want to be a part of your church. We need him to come into our hearts as individuals, but we also need him in our churches. The people of Laodicea, though, they seemed quite content to show up on Sundays, do their thing, and go home without the Lord ever being a part of their service. We can't have church until the Lord shows up. We may meet together. We may sing out of our book. We may preach out of our book. We may pass our plates. We may have different things that we do that looks like church. But if Jesus is standing on the outside knocking and asking to come in, we may call it what we want, but we cannot call it church. We can call it our club. We can call it our religion. We can call it our thing to do. But if Jesus is standing on the outside knocking, my friends, we cannot call it church. It's only the church if we are the ones that are called out and assembled together, gathered in the name of Jesus. Upon this rock I will build my church. It's his church. But if we have not let him in, it's our club. It is not his church. He says, though I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone, any one, all it takes is an individual. Yes, the church is the body of Christ. It's a corporate, collective gathering of people. But all it takes is one person to invite the Lord into this church. And great things can happen. Is the Lord a part of your church? Or is he on the outside knocking? If anyone will hear his voice and let him in, then he'll come in. Yes, Jesus holds the keys. Yes, Jesus could open the door at any time. He could kick it down. He could walk right through it like he did in the upper room. Jesus can enter if he wants to, but he will never force his way into a church. The classic painting of Jesus knocking in the door with Revelation 3.20 written under it. The door only has a doorknob on the inside. Jesus is not going to turn the handle. He's not going to stick the key in the lock. He's not going to kick it down. He's going to patiently knock and see if we will open the door from the inside and invite him to come into the church. But the people in Laodicea did not want the Lord in the church because they were lukewarm, content to go right down the middle of the road. But Jesus says, I'm knocking. I'm waiting. I'm knocking. And if anyone will let me in, Jesus says, then I will come in and I will eat with you. I will fellowship with you. I will spend time with you. We'll be a real church if anyone will let me in. Is he knocking at the door of this church? Is he knocking at the door of your church? Is he knocking at the door of your heart? If you hear him knocking and you let him in, then he will save your soul if you've never been saved. Or he will revive this church if we've become lukewarm. Oh, I believe Jesus is knocking at many doors tonight. Doors of Baptist churches. He's knocking at many hearts. Won't you let him in before he stops knocking? Thank you for tuning in tonight. Please reach out and message us if you have any questions. We'd love to talk with you further. And we hope to see you all very soon. God bless.